Welcome to Making a Difference. Today we have as our guest Tony Oppenheimer. Um, Tony's got a very interesting life and I can't wait to ask him a number of questions. But the first question, Tony, I'm going to ask you is what life experience have you had or experience have you had that made you so involved and, and desirous to be uh, involved in charitable activities? My life experiences are varied, but quite frankly, it's my family connections and family tradition that uh, got my wife and myself into philanthropy. Uh, my grandparents were Jules and Doris Stein, and uh, they created the Jules Stein Eye Institute and the Jules and Doris Stein Foundation, and he was the creator of MCA Became Universal Studios. And then New Wasserman, who became the president of MCA, made it what it was, um, was also the chairman of our foundation. So I really learned from the three of them about philanthropy. And uh, I'm the third generation for our family foundation. And my father was a Marine general, and he also uh, was philanthropic in two areas. One, he went to Harvard, and the second for the Marine Corps. And uh, it's from those various family members from which I and my brothers and the rest of our family got involved in philanthropy. And we broke up the Jules and George Stein Foundation in four parts, and my brothers and I have one of the parts called the Oppenheimer Brothers Foundation, a misnomer since it's mostly run by our wives. Really? And my wife also is very much a philanthropist. Uh, her family are George and Florida and in Kansas City, and we're very much involved in philanthropy in Kansas City, particularly in the Jewish community. And um, her mother was a major uh, supporter and founder of several uh, cancer uh, research programs. And uh, George not only was involved with the Jewish community, he helped create the Jewish community campus there, uh, but was also a, a big Boy Scout and helped a lot of other, particularly Jewish members of the community, become Eagle Scouts. So l let me um, work our way back and talk to you about Jules Stein, who's a big name in this town. Yes. And was he very much involved in charity while he was working as a doctor and MCA? Is that, what the, is that where you learned the f fundamentals, the foundation of what you're doing Without today? question. Tell us, expand on that a little bit. Well, he, was the, uh, he created MCA and then later bought out uh, Universal Studios in 1962. But Prior he was a that, doctor. He was an eye doctor, right? He was. He was an eye doctor, but frankly, he went to the University of Chicago for medical school. And while he was there, he was leading bands uh, to pay for medical school. And he met my grandmother when he was uh, playing at the Mulebach Hotel in Kansas City, and she was in the audience. Uh, he really flipped a coin between continuing to be an eye doctor and surgeon or to continue with MCA, which at that time was basically him on a telephone. And he created MCA when other bands noticed he was always able to get jobs, always had gigs going. So they said, well, can you manage our band? And so he said, I'll charge you 10% of the gross, and that was MCA. So he'd perform surgery in one room and then run back and uh, book a band and go back to being an eye doctor. And finally, finally he decided, you know, I've got to do one or the other. And that's how he created MCA. Then he hired Lou Wasserman when Lou was only about 20, who eventually ended up running the company. And when he, my grandmother one time turned to him and said, you know, you're going to have to watch out for Lou Wasserman. I think he's trying to take over the company. Grandfather said, well, if he's not one to take over the company, I don't need him. So at some point, uh, grandfather became emeritus, chairman of the board, and Lou ran the company. So my grandmother turned to him one day and said, you know, you're not, you're not having the same excitement you used to have. Why don't you go back to being an eye doctor? And he says, Doris, it's been 30 years. And he said, well, there's a little college at the bottom of the hill called UCLA. Why don't we create an institute for eye surgery and research? And thus he started the Jules Stein Eye Institute. And then later, when uh, he passed away, my grandmother was in charge of our foundations. Um, she extended us the idea of creating a second building with the Doris Stein Research Pavilion. And so when she passed away, Lou Wasserman being the chairman of our foundation, my whole family got together and created the uh, 
the second building, which is named after her. There now is a third building that Casey Wasserman is working on creating on the same corner uh, at UCOA, and I think that's going to be completed in a couple years. So the Jules Stein Institute has been a major part of what Marty and I and my brothers do. In fact, we gave a um, chair to Cataract Research a number of years ago. And then my wife is uh, co-chair of the Jules Stein Affiliates. Okay, so that's terrific. That's a wonderful story. Thank you. So how did Tony first get involved in philanthropic activities? How old were you? And you know, of course you had a wonderful mentor and, and, and family in, in family members. My grandmother set up the, uh, the uh, foundation in such a way that she wanted all of us to participate. And um, I think I was in my mid-20s when I really became involved with the, the foundation. And at that time, she was uh, allowing all of us to have a certain amount of funds that we could donate. But in order to prove that we really cared about what we were donating, we had to come up with our own matching gift. So we had to come out of our own pocket to be able to uh, uh, get funds from the foundation. And so in a sense, we had a junior board. Now, my brothers and I decided to continue with that. Uh, we have a junior board for our own foundation. And there, we're not requesting that our next generation have, uh, make matching grants, but they do have to do side business. And they have to spend so many hours a year giving to charity of their own time. And so in that way, you're, you're having them embrace philanthropy, which is what happened with me, rather than becoming a check writing event. Making a Difference will return right after this. You're obviously involved in a number of different organizations. Well, let's start out by you just telling us your top two favorites, why you're involved, what kind of difference you're making, and where your passion is. I think the uh, first one, without question, is the Oppenheimer uh, Collection of Contemporary Art. In fact, we have a book, which, my, uh, which we created when we first uh, started buying art for a museum that was created on campus at Johnson County Community College in Kansas City. And there's many reasons why we got involved in that. First of all, it was about a month after Marty and I got married. So we were doing this right from the start. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary here in a couple of days and the 20th anniversary of the museum collection and college collection uh, in September of this year. And we got involved for several reasons. One. Uh, it really, in philanthropy, I've discovered one thing leads into another. They have a great sculpture collection at UCLA called the Franklin Murphy Sculpture Collection. We are having our foundation meetings at the Joel Stein Institute. Marty and I'd go outside and notice that you know all the uh, students were sitting around the Matisse backs and you know having lunch underneath um, you know Rodin's Walking Man, and so we thought we could do something like this. So we went back to Kansas City, we looked for an opportunity, and we met a director of, at that time, just the college collection named Bruce Hartman. We were intrigued by the fact of having 45,000 students on a college campus in the Midwest who had probably never really uh, been, uh, had an opportunity to see contemporary art. So uh, we thought, here's an opportunity to do something where they can have a dialogue with it every day. And in fact, there's a large Barry Flanagan piece. It's about 18 feet tall, bronze, outside. And it sits right outside the library. Many times I've heard the students say, I'm not, not that I'm going to meet you at the library, I'll see you at the rabbit. Uh, because it's a, a, a rabbit jumping over the Liberty Bell. So there we've it has matriculated, in a sense, to many other kinds of opportunities for us in the arts. Uh, Marty and I are on the National Gallery Collection Committee in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're on the acquisition committee at MOCA and at LACMA here in Los Angeles. The second thing is the Jules Stein Institute. There, it's really more of a legacy. Uh, we felt that it's important for us to continue what Jules and Doris Stein did. So as I said, we created a cataract research program. Um, we're very much involved with there, as many of our other family members. Jerry Oppenheimer, my uncle, is very involved. And so it's been something that we can all share. 
and I think that's important in a family, is to be able to share the passions that you have, but still recognize that each of us have a different passion. So those are the two main areas two main that areas. you're focused on. Um, how much time do you spend a week in these areas? A lot. Marty and I are very much involved with, uh, particularly in the arts for Marty and I. We um, go to a lot of MOCA events. We're on the acquisition committee. We are very much involved with uh, LACMA. We're on the, the uh, collection committee there. And they always have these wonderful events. And at the same time, we do quite a bit at Jewel Stein Eye Institute. There's always something happening in each of these entities. And we're going to be at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. Uh, coming up in a month when they have their meetings. So you spend a lot of time, but you know, that's part of it. In other words, it's not a check writing event. It's something you have to be passionate about. And I know we're going to talk in a few minutes about the next generation, and I'd like to expand on that when we get to there. Well, we, we can move right there unless you want to expand it all on, on the existing organizations that you're helping and involved with. I can add to the two that we mentioned. Uh, Marty and I are very much involved in Kansas City at the Nelson Atkins Museum. Uh, we made a major gift to the new Kaufman Music Center. We do a lot with Children's Mercy Hospital. Uh, I was once chairman of Lyric Opera in Kansas City. So we've been involved there, and we were born and raised there, although Marty spent 20 years in Texas. Um, and so we've all come from a background of philanthropy. Now we're living here permanently. So we're involved with the art events, uh, but we're also involved with uh, several other groups. Marty is on Blue Ribbon at the Music Center. Uh, we, are, we have been donors of Robertson Gardens. We've been involved with the LA Library Foundation. And um, one of the things that I find really intriguing is the Fulfillment Fund which is headquartered here. Gary Gitnick is the founder and the chairman. A good friend of mine was once uh, the, um, uh, at, he's now at UCOA, of course, as a senior uh, fundraiser there, as well as uh, chief of staff of medicine at the uh, UCOA Medical Center. And there, they do a lot of things to be able to help kids in poor neighborhoods, uh, in distressed neighborhoods many times get out of the uh, troubles they're in, which many times might include gang membership, et cetera, to be able to get into, finish high school, and get into college. And the opportunities they have includes not only scholarships, but also mentoring systems. And one of the things I've noticed is that many of the younger people who graduate from these programs become mentors to the next generation coming up. So I really enjoy our membership in the Fulfillment Fund. More Making a Difference after this. So that makes a wonderful transition to my next question you've been anticipating. And that is, what can you tell young people about the gratification of giving? It's really interesting. Um, there's a variety of ways of looking at it. One is coming from a background like our family, where it was a tradition in the family. Um, as you know, I've been a consultant to many family foundations. And one of the things that I work with, and I give a lot of speeches to the Association of Small Foundations on these very topics, how do you get the next generation involved? Many parents want to get their kids involved. And if they want to have kids with a philanthropic uh, uh, desire, they must start early. Uh, Sadaka, for instance, in my wife's family, was very much part of um, when she got allowance, she was supposed to pay back some of it to charity. The first person who asked her for a donation was her mother. Okay? But what happens is, many times, for instance, we have a junior board. We thought that we'll just set up some funding and the kids will all be intrigued and love to do it. Well, it didn't turn out that way because we're trying to get them to emulate us as the parents. The kids have to do it their own way. Now our junior board is very robust because when they call a meeting, they show up. We're not even invited. And because of that, they, everybody shows up. Everybody comes to the meeting. <clears throat> when I used to call the meetings, maybe a few would show up. So the main thing is get out of the kids' way. They don't want to emulate us. They want to have their own identity. And the second thing is, there is so much they can get 
from being involved in philanthropy. Now let's say I'm not talking to the parents about your children, but to the, then the children might be 50 years old. Okay, but they're a next generation of some nature. And that is, first of all, you can get something out of it that perhaps you don't get out of your day job. You know, there's a way to broaden your horizons, to be involved in the community, to meet other people who are very uh, involved in charity and interested in the same activities that you're interested in. And that's important, but if you're very young in the high school and college uh, age, it's important to have this on your college application. There are so many people trying to get into college. They look first at what else do you do, and philanthropy always looks good. And you've hired many people in your company. When you see, uh, and your company is very philanthropic. When you see someone has a background of philanthropy, I think that puts a little bit of positive edge on good the point. resume. Am I correct? Excellent point. We like to see that. Yeah. It's a good character trait. What is? And the thing is, you don't have to come from a family of wealth. In other words, there are many opportunities to have philanthropy of the spirit. Well, we have people here in our organization that come from no wealth, and they, they're very much involved in giving back. Absolutely. And the reason they do it is it makes them feel good about themselves. That's right. And the other thing is, many times kids can start not because they have a family foundation, but because they're in Boy Scouts. They have, they're at the temple. They have things they can do in school where they can start the process of becoming involved with philanthropy. Well, Tony, you've done a great deal for many people, and this is obviously a big part of your life for Thank you. since you were a very young man, and yes. it sounds like you're carrying on the tradition with your family members, the same sort of thing. And not only have you given this a lot of thought, you've told me that you speak on these subjects publicly to help others. I do. In fact, to be honest with you, it's what I like to do the best. Fabulous. Um, in our foundation, if I can expand a little bit, we had extensive family dynamics. And uh, when uh, Lou Wasserman stepped down, some of that rose to the surface, and we broke our foundation up into four parts, which my brothers and I have one of the parts. Right. And my first speech was with the Councilman Foundations and then followed up by the Association of Small Foundations of why you don't have to break your foundation up. You know, you can still manage the assets. Right. But you can do it in such a way that each of my three brothers and I have our own mission statements. And because of that, I've told you about my activities. My brothers, one of my brothers was one of the founders of the Grameen Foundation for micro lending to women in Bangladesh. So there's a wide variety of interests that you can have. And consequently, his kids travel and uh, spend summers in huts in Africa and other places building libraries or, or things of that nature. That's taking it to a whole new level. Absolutely. Well, Tony, I want to thank you very much for joining us and sharing with us the importance of giving. And I want to thank you for coming. And I want to thank you, Tony, for joining us today and making a difference. I'm Bruce Hartman, Executive Director of the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art on the campus of Johnson County Community College. The college is located in suburban Kansas City and is one of the largest community colleges in America with an enrollment of over 36,000 students. In 1980, the college trustees made the decision to begin a collection of contemporary art. In 1990, a new gallery of art was opened on the campus in a cultural education center. And in 2007, we opened the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art on the campus. Designed by architect Q Sung Woo of Cambridge, Massachusetts, the very contemporary minimalist museum building is completely clad in limestone indigenous to the area. The interior galleries feature a range of exhibition spaces for the permanent collection, for changing exhibitions, a new media gallery, an auditorium, etc., as well as a cafe and a museum store. The college itself has a huge enrollment, and the students very much are active in visiting the museum. Many classes utilize the collection for assignments and we continue to build the collection as it exists today. 
The Oppenheimer collection forms the core of the museum's permanent collection. Begun in 1992, Marty and Tony Oppenheimer have gifted over 150 works of art. Initially, major sculptures were commissioned by artists such as Jonathan Borofsky, Louise Bourgeois, Barry Flanagan, Judith Shea, Stefan Balkanal, and many others. The Doho Cell Robe, adjacent to myself, was our last acquisition in sculpture. As we moved towards the opening of the Nerman Museum, we began to acquire paintings, works on paper, photography, ceramics, metal objects, and other works of art for the museum collection. The collection continues to grow. We add annually numerous pieces, traveling the country and internationally to acquire works of art. In 2006, Johnson County Community College was named one of the top 10 universities or colleges in America for art on campus.